and, and our spirits are bearing witness that I know you were there. I, I know I wasn't by myself. I know I ain't get through that without you. It's, it's bearing witness, and that is doing something in us, and we thank God for it this morning. So we've been, um, well, we had a fifth Sunday, and we had a kid's Sunday, so it's been a couple weeks, and we are starting a new sermon series this morning, and um, we'll see how long we're going to be here, but we're going to stay here for a little while. I take this first week of the sermon series to simply lay the foundation for where we're going. It gives us um, a broader roadmap to what we're going to be discussing in these next couple weeks. So I'm going to take some time today to really lay the foundation. And the title of our new sermon series is The Idol of Convenience. The Idol of Convenience. Because it is beautiful that he walks with us and he talks with us. And the song said, if you say it's wrong, I'll say no. It said, if you say it's wrong, I'll say no. So with that, we are going to talk about how sometime the idol of convenience will get in the way of our transformation in Christ. And we're going to break that down just a little bit. Quit, if you could do me just a favor and make sure that that plug does not slip out, because otherwise we'll lose our people online. It's, it's, uh, it's trailing. Thank you. So the idol of convenience, before we even get into what that is and what that does, I just want to break down the words for so that we know where we're going. What is convenience? Convenience is, so we just came out of conducive. And conducive is something that's helpful and, and good for, and we said for us, the way we were using conducive was that it was good for where Christ is trying to take you. Now, convenience and conducive, some people might relate them in meaning, but for us, they are almost completely opposite. Convenience is what makes something have ease of use. It, it brings forth ease. Ease is actually the, the key word when you talk about convenience. There's ease. Convenience tends to lend to what is comfortable. So it is easy. It is comfortable. And it involves little or no effort. There's no trouble involved when something is convenient. You don't need to put forth a bunch of effort when something is convenient. But the biggest part of convenience that will lead us in these next couple of weeks is that it fits well, one definition says, what a person's needs, activities, and plans. Now, the challenge with that is that, yes, it might be convenient to our needs, activities, and plans. But the Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The Bible says that many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps. The Bible says that it's not in man to know the way that we should go. So the problem with convenience is that, yes, it might be easy and comfortable, and it involves little trouble or effort, but it's your needs as defined by you, your activities as defined by you, and your plans as defined by you. The challenge with convenience is that it begins to take such a forward place in our life. We have no idea how reliant we are upon convenience. We are adapted to convenience. We are addicted to convenience. And convenience has held us in many ways naturally back. But spiritually, we can't afford to live by and bow to the idol of convenience. I want to talk to you naturally a little bit about it. Convenience, we know it very well by technology. Technology has advanced. It has made life more convenient. We, back in humanity, used to have to walk. Walking was the only way that there was. Then they figured out, I might can get on this animal if he let me, and he could take me much faster. It was convenient. But we found even more convenience when we figured out that you could use this engine with this gasoline and all this other stuff, and we could actually go further faster, and we could do that without having to deal with taming the animal. We had the car, and then we had more convenience to say, I want to travel further, and I want to do it faster. And so we, we humanity is, is gifted in coming up with the plane, and it's convenient. I can get from North Carolina to California in five hours. That's a three-day drive. 
And I don't know how long it would be to walk. It's convenient. It's convenient. We have um, services that are convenient. And they're so convenient, we don't do nothing no more. I don't know when the last time I've been to Walmart. Because if, if you anything like me, um, Jeff Bezos, he should know my name. Um, <laughs> Jeff Bezos should know my name. Amazon is at the house. Raise your hand if Amazon is at your house twice a week. R raise your hand if you've had groceries delivered. Raise your hand if you've had food delivered. I'm not saying, I'm just saying, like, we, we, it's convenient. It's convenient. We don't have to go to the grocery store. We don't have to go to Walmart. We, I saw a commercial the other week that said for $19, I don't believe it, but it said for $19, somebody will come clean your house. So I don't have to, you know, I don't believe it. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe a $19 job. But for $19, somebody can clean your house. Somebody can bring you your groceries. Somebody, matter of fact, Walmart said, you don't even have to put them in the refrigerator. If you give us a code, we will come in your house and put your groceries in the refrigerator. Amazon said, you don't got to worry about the porch pirates. If you don't want to sit outside, give us the code, and we will set it in your garage. If you get an electronic item, when you start, when, other than them trying to sell you all the insurance, you, um, one of the things they ask you, they said, do you need assembly? Because you don't have to put this together. We will deliver it, put it together, and take the box out with us. It's convenient. Our food is convenient. We, we have services that will bring the food cooked. We have services that will bring the items assembled. We have services. We, we have all these things. We have convenience, 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 convenience. Our kids can go on a game system and look at something that graphically is so beautiful that it looked like they across the world, but they don't go outside no more. It's convenient, but is it always helpful? It's convenient, but does it always yield us to our best? Or does convenience lean itself to laziness sometimes? Does it lead itself to not thinking sometimes? It's convenient. The idol of convenience, though, is much more sinister than Amazon bringing a package to your house. It is much more sinister than playing a video game all day. The idol of convenience is something that is much deeper. In Exodus 23, the first commandment that God gives Moses, he tells him, you shall have no other God's before me. That means don't put nothing before me. Don't allow anything to sit on the throne of your heart. Don't, don't make space for something in such a way that is not me. Don't put any other gods before me. That is a command. Don't do it. And it's what God is telling them. But I would suggest to us today as we move forward in this sermon series that there are times when as we bow to the idol of convenience, we are moving God off his throne and we are yielding to something that is not him. For that, I want to give you a couple scriptures because, again, I'm laying the foundation. I want to teach a little bit this morning. One of the things you will see and hear across the whole Bible is the idea of idolatry, idolatry, idolatry. And because we don't worship statues, although some people still do, because we don't bow our heads to statues exactly like they did in the Old Testament. We are far from idolatry sometimes. But I'm about to give you the essence of idolatry so you can understand that it's more than a statue. And it has more to do with a mindset. Here's the essence of idolatry. And you can go back on YouTube and get this if I move too fast. So I'm saying that convenience can be an idol. And that is to say that the essence of idolatry is to yield to yield. When you yield to something, if you are driving and you yield, it means before I go straight through this thing, I'm going to stop and consider and look to see. If you are yielding to something, I stop and consider with consideration toward this thing. I yield to something or someone as though it were God. I take a pause for you like you are my creator. I take a pause for you like you give breath in my lungs. It's a place that's a little bit too high or something. 
or something sometimes. Sometimes it's a substance where you, you yield, you, you, whatever this want to do, you yield to someone or something as though it were God. That yielding is a part of the essence of idolatry. Alignment. To get into alignment with the word. And it could be word you said, a word somebody else said. To get in alignment with the words and the thoughts of somebody or something that is completely contrary to God's word. But it becomes idolatry when I know God's word and I heard this word. But my, my choice is to align myself with this and not that. And anytime you align yourself to this and not that, you are bowing. You might not be bowing with your knee, but you are taking a bow to whatever it is you aligned yourself with and yield to. The next one, the essence of idolatry is to offer, offer time, talent, treasure, and your body with disregard for God's word or God's way. So you offer up everything you have, your time, your talent, your money, and your body is all you have. And if you take that and offer it in such a way that is a disregard to God's word and his way, you have taken a bow. It's the essence of idolatry. To give over, last one for this one, to give over your heart and your mind consistently to what is not God. If you notice in all these things, idolatry needs you. It needs you. It has to have you. Idolatry needs your free will. It needs your decision making. It needs you. So the essence of idolatry is yielding, aligning, offering, and giving what should only be God's. And so when I say the, the essence, I mean, when I say the idol of inconvenience, we're going to look at it in these next couple of weeks, how much inconvenience or convenience hinders us from moving forward in God. But to lay the foundation before we start on those weeks, it's inconvenient. It was inconvenient for Jesus to become the Christ. It was inconvenient for him to leave heaven. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. He said, the infinite left that to become the finite. The infinite became an infant. He became incarnate. And he became incarnate because he had to. Because his, his love for us, as we've so eloquently discussed this morning, his love for us was so deep that there was no way that we were going to get out on our own. We didn't have it on our own. Moses didn't have enough. David didn't have enough. Abraham didn't have enough. There was no great person in the Bible. Mary herself didn't have enough. Nobody had enough to secure this salvation. All of us have fallen short of the glory. All of us have found our way in sin. And so he came, but he came at great inconvenience. And I don't know if we think about that sometimes, that God had to wrap himself in flesh to come here. He had to leave all that heaven is to come to earth in all that it is and would be through time. It was inconvenient to become the Christ, but he did it anyway. Philippians 2, 4 through 8, Paul tells us, let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves. King James Version says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So it's telling us, have this mindset right here. Here is the mindset, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Stay right there for a second, Sean. For Jesus to come to the earth, he had to empty himself to come and wrap himself in this finite flesh. He had to empty himself. The one that spoke all things into existence had to become a dependent infant. The God who knows all things had to become a baby that would need to be carried and changed and fed. And he subjected himself to this totally inconvenient way 
because he loves us. He emptied himself so that he could put on our likeness. He emptied himself. And I don't know if we stay there and think about how inconvenient it is. I don't know if, 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 I don't know if he said brothers. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you, if I told you that one of your family members' lives was dependent on it. But in order for them to live, you got to give up everything. Empty your bank account. Leave your job. Sell your house. Give up all your possessions, all your jewelry, all your shoes. <laughs> give up everything that is to you. The only thing you will have is your body. But if you give all this stuff up, you ain't going to have nothing. But they're going to live. You ain't going to have nothing. I ain't going to tell them how long it's going to take you to get it back. Yeah, Jesus. Uh -huh. But they're going to live. Could you imagine the inconvenience of losing everything for somebody else to live? He emptied himself. Verse 8 says, And being found in, the form, in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, I thought about calling this cross as ain't convenient because it was nothing convenient about going to the cross. But as I began to study, I realized it's not just the cross only. Jesus, whole, his whole life. The Bible says he's a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. That means that while he was blessed and while he was anointed and while he was God in the flesh, that when Jesus walked around, there was a sorrow that walked with him. There was a, a sorrow for sin, a sorrow for human condition, a sorrow for hurting, that when he walked with him, there was a sorrow. So if there's somebody that is dealing with depression and dealing with things that are difficult in your mind, you can know that your Lord understands you at all points. He knows what it is to walk around and function with sorrow following you. A man of sorrow, well acquainted with grief, the Bible says. He knows all of this. And he did that through the life he lived. And then he did it through the death that he died. So it's not so much only the cross and the resurrection, but his life itself was a life that was severely inconvenienced. The Bible says that Jesus said, foxes have holes, de de um, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So there was nowhere to, to live. He had Mary's house, but he really, that wasn't a part of the ministry and what he was called to. So there was no mansion to go to. There was no stallion to ride. This life that Jesus came to live was that of a poor boy from Nazareth, and it was completely inconvenient, but also completely necessary. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake has become poor, so that by his poverty, might become that so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus was completely inconvenienced and stripped off everything that glory had in heaven so that he could be poor that you might be rich. So that he can be poor that you might be reconciled, that I might be reconciled. And it was completely inconvenient. He is going to give us one more, um, two more, actually, things that I want to lift into this particular introduction to this sermon series. So Jesus left all that to become poor, that we might become rich. On the night of the Last Supper, John 13, 12 through 17, Jesus is kneeling down and washing their feet. And it is completely inconvenient for somebody of his stature, for the rabbi, to be kneeling down and washing the feet of his disciples. It is the job of the lowest servant in the house to wash the feet. But he inconvenienced himself once again, not just coming from heaven, but even in his earthly life, he kneels down. And it says, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. I am that. If then, I, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Feet washing is inconvenient. 
Feet washing takes humility. Feet washing takes you taking off an ego and an attitude. Feet washing means you got to handle somebody's feet and you don't know what condition they're in and what they look like and what they smell like and, and all those other things. But feet washing help, it will humble one. And Jesus saying, if I wash feet, you ought to wash feet. If I'm inconvenienced, if it's not easy, if it takes much effort from me, then it should take much effort from you. If I can humble myself and come down from heaven, you can humble yourself within the earth. So you ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. You do to them what I have done to you. Truly, truly, Jesus says, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And we've been talking about knowing and doing in Bible study. If you know these things, that's one thing. But blessed are you if you do them. So Jesus is showing them that convenience ain't a part of this walk. You will be inconvenienced walking with Jesus a many day and a many time. One of the things about convenience, though, and I'm going I'm to take the time in the next couple of weeks to come down all of our streets. I really am. Drive slow. If the Bible is the word of life, and we are a Bible study in church, and that's good and that's well, but if the Bible is, a, is the word of life, and you believe that it has the word of life, and we believe it when it says it's the engrafted word that is able to save our souls. We believe it when we say that reading this word is going to help un you understand and reveal the character and the nature and the things of God. If we believe that the Psalms are prayers and cries, that whatever season we find ourselves in, we can find a psalm and a prayer to assist us in our prayer to God. If we believe that, why don't we read it? Why don't we read our Bibles? I don't listen to secular music like that. It catch me sometime when I'm in the store. But if you're in my car, that's not my station. That ain't, that ain't my thing. But I grew up listening to hip hop. And if you ask me the words to Dear Mama right now, I could probably give you all of them. If you ask me, I ain't gonna go there. But <laughs> what I'm saying is, I got years of songs in my head, years of songs in my head, and you do too. You got, matter of fact, if I said he gonna cry in the car, y'all, yeah, now, come on now, I know y'all caught that. I know y'all caught that. Better tuck your chain, huh? King Kong. I'm just using examples. We know songs. We know lines from movies. We got this stuff stored in our memory and our heart. But if I ask you right now to recite me the three most valid scriptures to your life and your soul, not Psalms 23 and not Jesus wept and not God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If I ask you to give me three scriptures that are not those, many people can't give me anything. We can recite the lines to a movie. We know the actor's lines, but we don't know Jesus' lines. There's something wrong with that. And the reason we don't know is because we will not be inconvenienced enough to read the Bible. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much, but we don't pray. I have watched, I have watched, and I have watched and I have watched God, and I have seen times where I have laid out in prayer. I mean laid out in prayer, and I literally watched that thing in the earth begin to change and move. And I know I'm not the only one praying, but I know that it was him that was moving the thing. I have laid out for y'all. You don't know. I've laid out for your family. I have laid out for your health, your mental health, your spiritual health, and God will move on that thing, and we will watch God shield and protect because the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much, but we'd rather get mad than pray. 
Praying is inconvenient. I'd rather be mad. I'd rather be in my feelings. That's what the song say. Get out your feelings. I mean, they ain't say it like that. That's how I say it. Stop feeling. Let the spirit lead you. But we rather feel than pray. If I thought that praying for a family member every day was going to break something off their life, there are strongholds. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. A stronghold is a mindset. That's how you get an idol of something because it got your mind. A stronghold is a mindset. When you say something like, I can't really function without this. When you say, I, I need this to, to kind of keep my day going. I, I, I need this to kind of, it's, it's an idol and it's a stronghold. But if I told you, you could pray every day and God will begin to break that thing. That you would see family members and children and, and people walking differently then you probably would pray. But guess what? That is true. And we don't pray. We don't pray because it's inconvenient. You know why we don't get up an extra hour to give God time? Because I'd rather sleep. I love my sleep. I'd rather sleep than get up and give him time. Some of you that are online, I'm coming down your street too. You looking at me right now on YouTube. Partly. Because it's convenient. Now you might, somebody might have some challenges and all that, but partly it's convenient because when we cut off, you can go to the kitchen. We got to drive on home. But there's something in here this morning that although you can be blessed by this word, and I pray you are, that you maybe didn't feel because you weren't in the assembly of the saints. Some of it could be health. Technology is useful. Some of it's just convenience. It's just convenience. Jesus, when he's talking to Peter in Hebrew, I mean in Matthew 16, it said from that time on, this is, we're going to go back in time from the Last Supper. This is as he's moving toward Jerusalem. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and that he must suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers. Let me tell you how inconvenient that is to be opposed by the ones that should be upholding you. The elders should be the leaders of the community, giving direction to the community. They should be pointing toward Jesus. The chief priests are the ones that are facilitating the spiritual health of the community. They should be pointing toward Jesus. And the teachers of the law are the ones that are teaching the law of God. But if anything, they should be able to see in Jesus that this is something different. And they should be pointing toward Jesus, but they are not. He is opposed by the very ones that should be lifting him up. But he said, I'm going to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And we know this very well. Peter took him to the side to rebuke him. And he told Jesus, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Let me say it this way. Jesus has come so that we might live. He has become poor that we might become rich. He has come that we can be reconciled to God. And although Peter has come to him and he loves him, Peter is telling him there is a more convenient way to come against Rome than what you're saying. There is a more convenient way to get at the, the chiefs and the elders, and, and it is a more convenient way to deal with the, the teachers of the law because I've seen you walk on water. I walked on it with you. I've seen you transfigure. I know you chill with Elijah and Moses. I know for a fact you got a more, I know it's something in your pocket I ain't never seen. So I know you got a more convenient way than to let these people kill you. So no, that ain't happening. That ain't happening. Jesus rebukes him calls Peter Satan because your convenience ain't going to lead to their confession. and Your convenience ain't going to lead to their salvation. Your convenience ain't going to lead to glory. So, Peter, you got in mind the things of humans. You're thinking like humans. You're yielding to convenience. That ain't where I'm at. Jesus turned to his disciples after he said this to Peter. And in verse 24, he says, whoever, 
is where our, this is our anchor scripture for this sermon series. Whoever wants to be my disciple. And we have to clarify in our day and our time. I ain't, he ain't say whoever want to believe in me. He didn't say whoever wants to claim me. He didn't say who, whoever would say, well, I believe is one God. The Bible say the demons believe and tremble. He didn't say about claiming him. He said, if you want to be my disciple. And that is a line of demarcation for a lot of us. There are a lot of believers. There are people that conveniently uh, 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 love God. There are people that he is very much an accoutrement to their life, and they will use him when they need him. He make them look good, and he add to their life, and it sound good to talk about him. But that is not somebody that is saying they are be a, a disciple. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my student, if you want to come after me, then you must deny yourself. And being inconvenienced is an aspect of self-denial. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Because whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life, that means that has yielded, has aligned, and has offered and given all these things to Jesus, that whoever loses their life in that way, for me, will find it. So inconvenience is a part of this walk. Last slide. We will never be transformed into what God wants to make us as long as we favor convenience. It is convenient to not be generous. It is convenient. It is convenient to, to sleep as long as you want. It's convenient not to read that Bible. It's convenient. It's convenient. It's convenient. It's convenient not to bear one with another. I was just talking to somebody about this. There's a scripture that says, bear one with another. That means there are some parts about you and some parts about me that could ab absolutely get on your nerves. I mean, just get, just drive you up a wall. And it don't mean that it's sinful. It just means this component of your personality gets on my nerves. And this component of my personality get on your nerves. And the Bible says, bear one with another. I know they like this. If it's not sinful, they just aggravate me. I'm going to bear with them. I'm going to bear with them. I ain't going to start nothing unnecessarily. I'm going to bear with them. It is inconvenient to bear with somebody. It is inconvenient to pray for and bear with and labor for somebody that opposes you. But Jesus said, I was opposed by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and I'm still going to a cross for them. Because before they die, if they so change their mind, they still have a road to heaven. So I'm going. Bear one with another. That's a side note word. I don't know who needed that. Bear one with another. But it's inconvenient. The other part of inconvenience that we will get in in these next couple of weeks, sometimes we are willing to be inconvenienced for what we want. The last part of that definition said our needs our activities, our plans. When we come up with what we think we need, what we going to do, and what we plan, sometimes we will inconvenience ourselves for what we want. But how about we learn how to inconvenience ourselves for where God is leading? Song said, if you say it's wrong, I'll say no. If you say release it, I'll let go. It's inconvenient sometimes to follow him. But Christ has shown us through his example that we are not greater than our master. And there will be inconveniences in this walk. There will be inconveniences in this life. But we yield, we align with, we offer to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the beginning of this word. God, we thank you, God, for bringing our eyes, enlightening us, Father. As you take us through these next couple of weeks, we pray that you bless this sermon series. That for every place, God, you will shine a light. That within us, God, before you, that we, God, can bring this to your throne. God, that we can lay it down. God, we don't like to be inconvenienced. We live in a very convenient nation, Father. God, we pray, God, that you would help us. That we might have the strength 
to be with you, the strength to choose you, the strength to completely be transformed, Lord God. God, many people always say in talking about a mark of a beast that I wouldn't take it. But Father God, regardless of a mark of a beast, God, if we won't yield to you now, God, then what makes us think we will yield to you, even if that were true, God? God, we pray now for the strength to yield. We pray for the strength to be inconvenienced. We pray for what you said, Jesus, that if we're going to be your disciples, we must deny ourselves and follow you. God, a part of following you is getting in that word, getting in your house, God, giving you time for prayer, Lord God. We pray these things, God, over this word. Let us hear. Give us ears to hear, God, and let us no longer bow to the idol of convenience. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we offer up an additional prayer for um, Georgia, South Carolina, and Virginia, Tennessee, particularly Western North Carolina. God, we thank you today. God, we thank you that you are sending resources governmentally. But, God, we pray as a church, we ask that you send supernatural resources, God, for those that are tired in their minds and their bodies and they're hungry, for those that need medication and can't get to a pharmacy. We ask right now that you supernaturally regulate blood pressures. We ask that you supernaturally regulate diabetes, Lord God. God, we ask that you would minimize the pain for those who can't get to pain medication. God, we ask that you would touch those that are ailing in their bodies right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We ask that the food that they take in, that the sustenance begin to do such miraculous things in their body, Lord God. God, we ask that you put your hand on them right now. You are the great physician. So God, we pray. We pray for the first responders, God, that you would encourage them and give their body strength, Lord God. God, clear their minds from all the things that they have seen, Lord God. God, don't allow it to set in and torment them, Lord God, but give them supernatural strength, God. God, we plead your blood over the entire area, Lord God. Have your way. I pray that even in this, that some would find you that didn't know you. God, I pray that even in this, that your servants would step up. God, and not just send up our prayers, but send our hands, send our time, our treasure, and our resources, God. God, we thank you for who you are, God. We ask you to touch, 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 Lord God. Touch our nation as well, God, in this divided time, Lord God. Keep us, God. Show us that are yours, God, how to be yours at this tense time. God, we thank you when we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take up our offering at this time. If you are online and you would like to give, you can go to www.mas1.org. In the right-hand corner, you just click Give. If you would like to text to give, you have to set up that program. It is Tithely. The number is 704-228-4845. You just text the word give, and it will lead you on how to set that up. Our cash app handle is Emmaus, the number one. Our Venmo handle is the same, Emmaus, the number one. Um, speaking of offering as well, one of the things that we are going to do is um, – do what James said, not just keep talking, but sending resources and supplies to Western North Carolina. But I'll give you some more for that. But that is a part of an offering. God, we thank you this morning for this seed. God, we thank you, God, for those that gave, those that wanted to give, those that didn't have to give, for those that gave in time, talent. God, we just thank you for everybody putting their hand to the plow of this house. God, we pray to continue to be your stewards. We pray to continue to spread your word and your seed. God, throughout this earth. We actually bless this offering, God, and let it enable us to continue to do your work in the earth. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. couple announcements. Um, Bible study, we are wrapping up the book of James. Um, we're going to wrap up James, so you're going to read James 4 and 5. I am working on um, some things for Western North Carolina. We sent them one of the needs that were expressed. They need uh, clotheslines, so some of the people that are there that are that can hang some stuff up, so we went to Lowe's and got, some, got what they had pretty much, and we sent that. Um, 
we are going to, we had some of the school supplies left over from what we gave. So we're going to send, send that to the kids as well. We are going to, um, there is a, uh, many people have been moved to shelters in Rowan um, and in Mecklenburg. So I'm waiting to hear back to see if there is um, volunteer or something we can do for the people that have been brought locally to our area. So we definitely want to um, just not talk. Uh, we want to, um, we want to, to show, to do something. So we're going to see if there are some in-person opportunities, but then we also going to give the resources and on the level that we can to, to this tragedy. All right. Um, I want to, I'll wait. I'll, I'll wait. Uh, I want I want to pray for um, not just it's not it's a it's a few of y'all if y'all and I hope I'm um, <laughs> um so yeah so I'm a, I'm gonna try to do it briefly and quickly um, I just want to lift up those here today who are grieving in for different fashions um, and not just grieving in fashions it's not just even the pain. Um, I want to lift up the the love and the memory, and I want to give God thanks for all that he has given us through these lives. Um, we definitely, um, we remember uh, Tammy today. Um, Tammy is who I consider to be one of the first members of Emmaus, first person to call me pastor. Um, we lift up your mom today. Um, we want to cover these families. Um, part of grief is is love. The hurt goes so deep because the love went that deep. But I hope we can get to a place that to just be grateful for all the seeds that they left in the earth for all the strength that will continue to be blossomed out of people that they won't even see. Um, and just how good God is in that way. Let us pray. God, we thank you this morning. We bless your name. We thank you right now that you are holding your daughters in your hand. We thank you that there's no better place that they could be than in your arms right now, Lord God. We thank you, God, that we're trying to get to where they are. God, we thank you for loving us through them. We thank you for their hands. We thank you for their guidance. We thank you, Lord God, for being God and showing us yourself even through them. God, for right now, we pray for the strength to make it through this moment. God, we pray to, to be yielded enough, God, to see even how your hand has been on us even now. God, we thank you. We bless you. God, we cover your families, Lord. God, we cover them now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for keeping them. We thank you that the mantle falls, Lord God. The mantle falls, God. You don't just let the mantle leave the earth, God. The mantle falls. And therefore, you have leaders in the family. You have strong ones in the family, God, that will cover and keep and step right into, God, all the love and all the care, God, that we got lost when they left. God, you're still going to be God here. And we thank you that they're in your hands there. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll keep y'all in prayer. I will see you on Tuesday online, and then I will see you next Sunday, and we're going to get back into this idol of convenience. I probably have some more examples by then, too. Amen. All right, I will see y'all. Consider yourselves dismissed.